with a round of applause. Join me as we welcome God's choice servant, my father, Apostle Michael Orobo. Authority is one of the vital ingredients for building kingdom and government. In the realm of God, one of the greatest business of God is building an advancing kingdom. The jealousy of every spirit is to see that his government and his dominion continually is established and spreads. That's one thing that pursues every spirit. That's one thing that drives every spirit. Spirits have an obsession to establish kingdoms and dominions because the realm is divine, designed in that order. And so the moment God put man here, the first errand he gave him is to have dominion because his presence will be useless except as he's able to reflect the dimensions that are in the heavens on the earth realm. So the essence and the pursuit, the purpose of man's presence on the earth is to mirror heaven on earth. So that the dominion of God will extend from heaven to the earth realm and God will operate as king and ruler in all of the dispensations of his creation. And so authority is one of the vital ingredients for building kingdom and government. That's why authority is too important. And so the idea behind this conference is not just for God to bless you. God will bless you and bless you abundantly. But you have come to this conference to be equipped to build kingdom. To build the government of God in your sphere of influence. If you are a doctor, kingdom must appear there. If you are a lecturer, kingdom must appear there. If you are a lawyer, kingdom. That's why this conference has been put together. It's not just for to give you food to eat. By the time we begin to go further, you discover that those things are byproducts. You are too important in God's agenda to be begging for food. Food is supposed to be byproduct. The reason you are drawn to God is for something superior. And so when we are talking the business of authority, we are looking at establishing kingdom. In fact, there are three forces that kingdom rides on. The first is the will of the king. Every king and every spirit has a will. And so when a spirit wants to take over a territory, he defines his will to the agents and the agencies that are in that territory. Their ability to articulate the will of that spirit is the first sign that they have been brought into the equation of kingdom. But it's not enough to know the will of a spirit. When you receive the will of that spirit, you must also understand how that spirit intends for his errand to be run. And that is where wisdom comes in. So the second ingredient for building kingdom after the will of God is the wisdom of God. There is a way God builds. He said ensure that you build according to the patterns. You can't build by your own discretion. There is a pattern in the spirit that you must conform to. And so when a man wants to build kingdom, in addition to articulating the will of God, he must be brought into the equation of wisdom. He must tap from the frequencies of Zion and download it to the earth. Even the ark that Noah built, God told him, look at the dimensions. Don't be creative here. This thing you are about to do has its root in eternity past. It's older than humankind. It's a technology that is aged. You have come into something that is too old. You can't bring creativity into it. The patterns have been designed. And so for you to be effective in divine agenda, you must tap into wisdom. It's the second thing that builds kingdom. The third thing that builds kingdom is authority. Now that you have the pattern, you need the authority, the force, the power, the ability to bring it to pass. Because you will have oppositions. There are other functionaries that will negate what God wants to do. And so when you get God's wisdom, get God's will, then what caps it all is authority. In this conference, we want to look at the authority side of kingdom development. We want to look at the authority side of kingdom agenda. That is why we are gathered. Authority is the power of God delegated to man for man to represent God. Authority is a different type of power. There are many words for power in the realm of God. There is a word called al -ke. al -ke is the word for power that people like governors, that's how they are defined. You know, there is a power that comes by influence. You know, Solomon was ordained king, but there was a time when he began to reign. 
Because there are many people who are kings, but they don't reign. There are many people who are apostles, who don't have influence. There are many people who are governors, who don't have influence. So when a man has influence to make things happen, he's called Alke. The reason people gathered here is because Pastor Landry has Alke. So the moment he put a conference together, everybody wants to come. It's not because he's called House on the Rock. It's because there is Alke. That Alke is why you don't have space anywhere. That's a dimension of power. There's another word for power called Anagazo. Anagazo is compelling force. When you speak, your words become like law. It persuades and compels people. And so when a man has an Alcazo, he, he's, he's a master. He's good at transactions. That kind of authority is what a marketer needs. A banker will use an Agazo. Why a governor will use Alke? Why a governor needs influence? A banker needs persuasion. So that when he talks, he will open an account. A car dealer needs an Agazo. When he talks, you must buy the car. Even if you don't have money, you go and borrow and come and buy. You won't know why. It's when you go home, you say, why did I do this? You were manipulated by an agazo. It's a dimension of power. There's another power called exousia. Exousia is positional authority. Exousia is what gives you the ability to give commandments and creatures obey. So when a man has exousia, if he talks, demons will respond. It's a type of power. There's another power called dunamis. That one is the ability to create change. So if I come into this meeting and I want to deal with demons, I don't need dunamis. I need exousia. But if I want to demolish cancer, I will need something that will move like electricity. It will enter you and scatter the cancer. So the power that creates change is called dunamis. There's another power called iskus. I am, I am building foundation. I'm the first speaker, so allow me. I'm building foundation. When the other speakers come, they can start manifesting from the beginning. But allow. Are you, are you following? You know, if you read Colossians chapter one verse sixteen, you will see the word principality. That is alke. It means authority to influence. So when a spirit wants to take over a territory, they send the principality. Principality means he, the one that comes first. Preeminence. But the word is also al -key. They are the ones that have influence to take over a territory. Jesus speaking, he said, go to the highway and compel them. The word compare is anakazu. So that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church but it will be empty. So you need al -K to bring the finances and you need an Akazo to bring the people. So when they hear, they can't stop. It's a type of power. And then when demons are coming, you need Exousia to say, don't cross this boundary. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble and they will obey. And then when people come with problems, you need dunamis so that when you talk, you scatter it. Not many days from now, Acts 1.8, you shall receive the Holy Ghost and what? Power. And then you have East Coast, Ephesians 6.10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The word might there is the word iskus. Iskus is consistency. You need stamina. Because what you are doing this year, you will do it for 10 years. You will do it for 20 years. So you are not supposed to do it one month and the other month you have sank. The person who is singing, as we are celebrating her now, 30 years later we will still be celebrating her. Then you know that iskus is there. It's stamina. It's stamina. So, most of our fathers that you see today, they have been doing what they are doing for 50 years. They are still relevant. It's his kus. The power of his might. And then the other one is called Kratos. Kratos is dynamic power. Dynamic power. When the generator turns on, the light you see is no longer dynamics. It's now Kratos. All of these are types of power. But you see, in this conference, our concern is not power for persuasion. Our concern is not power to create change. Our concern is power to establish government. Because when you are dealing with authority, you are dealing with al you are dealing with Exousia, and you are dealing with Iskus. And that's what I want to teach on in the next 15 to 20 minutes. al is influence. 
if a believer will bring the influence of God to a territory, he needs al -Kay. The reason you will go to that bank and when you show up, they will know that Jesus has come is because you must have al -Kay. And then the reason you can expel devils from that place so that they no longer manipulate the people, but hear what you say, you will have exousia. And then the reason why what you are doing will remain and it will not stop even when you are gone is because you must have iskus. So when we are talking about believer's authority, we are not talking only about exousia. Believer's authority is a combination of three authorities. These are the three authorities that bring government. al exousia, and iskus. Why al brings influence? Exousia expels devils and iskus ensures longevity. So if we want the kingdom of God to subsist, then we must enter into the full scope of the believer's authority. There are those who have exousia. They don't have alke. So they are in one corner casting out devils. They become specialists of deliverance ministry. Anybody who has a demon finds them. And they remain in that cubicle for 30 years. It's not because God wants them to be small. But the governor cannot come under the government of Jesus. Meanwhile, he's casting out demons from there. And if he's the only person there, the kingdom won't advance. There are those who have this same exousia. They are in one corner. Every day they bring madman in chain. They rebuke the demon. They bring another one who can't sleep. They cast out the demon. But you won't know that Jesus is in that territory. Anytime they need Jesus, they find him. He's like a herbalist. That's not Christianity. A believer is not just supposed to have authority to cast out devils. A believer should have authority to influence the governor. To influence the president. To influence the commissioner. But for that to happen, you must have beyond exousia. You must have a K. So that when you enter a city, even without invitation, the governor will find you. Because everybody needs you. There is a relevance that your association brings to them. There is a credibility that your association brings to them. Listen, we are talking kingdom. And I'm trying to show you something that will make you relevant and eternally relevant. This meeting we are having today, when the next minister comes tomorrow, the overflow may double. It's called al -Kay. Because the influence is higher. And because the influence is higher, it will affect more people. There is a minister that will say, I'm coming for this conference. You will see the governor of this state seated here. Who invited you? Say, I feel like coming. You know what? It's called al -Kay. So when that person talks, it will affect government house. So we need to understand how authority works so that we grow in it. We must affect systems, we must affect spirits, and we must sustain the kingdom that we have established. That is when we are operating in the believer's authority. Now, how do you work in these three dimensions of authority that is available to you? We begin with al -Kay. al -Kay is an authority that was encoded into you by birthright. A king is not appointed. A king is born. al -Kay is a DNA type of authority. Because this type of authority is about class of life. It's about class of existence. When man was created in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, God said, let us make man. Now, when God was creating other things, there was no need for consultation. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it said, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, and the earth was void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God said, light be. Light appeared. And everything he wanted to do, he just gave commandment, and they appeared. But when he came to man, you don't just talk. There is something that must be encoded into him. And so God went back to the studio of eternity. At that place, there's no angel. You know, when he was creating the foundation of the earth, the Bible said the sons of God sang into the earth. The angels were present. They were seen. This one has to be a secret code. And so the father entered himself. And he went to where only God can get to. And the father was talking to the spirit. And the spirit was talking to the world. And the world was talking to the father. Let us make man. And he didn't say, in my image. Now, there are many princes in Zion. Oh, I wish you know them. When Gabriel appears here, mysteries flow like a river. When Michael appears, the excellency of Michael defines God's power. The Bible said the angels excel in strength. I was teaching someone, I told them, in the book of Revelation, an angel came to earth. 
the Bible says one of his foot covered the whole earth. Another one covered the whole waters. And when he shouted, one third of all the birds died. One third of every bird died. That's the power and the excellency that the angelic realm carries. If God created us like principalities, that would have been good. But God went a bit higher. He didn't create us as principalities. He created us as a, a dimension beyond principalities. And I will show you what I mean from the scripture. Listen, God said, let us make man. If he said in the image of Michael, that would have been beautiful. If he said in the image of Gabriel, that would have been beautiful. And he didn't stop there. If he said, let us make man like the Holy Ghost, that would have been excellent. If he said, let us make man like the world, that would have been excellent. If he said, let us make man like the Father, that would have been glorious, but that's not what he did. He said, let us make man in our own image. So when a man appears, he carries the dimension of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So, I'm telling you first that authority is a birthright before it's even something you try to access. You were created as a prince to operate in the corridors of power. And that's why when he did that, in Genesis 1.28, he said, let them have dominion. The word dominion is called radar in Hebrew. In Greek, it's called kuriotes. Kuriotes is a dignitary, a prince that has right to rule over a territory. That's why when he made man a dominion, he handed over earth to man. That means you are a legislator in the Zions of God. You are an authority holder in the realm of God. And so there was a prince that no longer had the territory. And when he saw that another Kuriotes had been born, he strode into the, 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 the garden and he wanted to receive the scepter. Because although the guy was not mature, although the guy did not know the secrets of God, although the guy was naive, although the guy was innocent, but he had the scepter. Because he was born with authority. And so when the devil showed up, he took that authority from him. When he met Jesus on the Mount of Temptation, he said, bow down to me. I will give you everything that you are seeing. For it has been delivered to me. Who delivered it? The Kuriotes from the garden. In fact, when Paul was ranking creatures in Colossians chapter 1, Look at what Paul said from verse 15. I want to show you where we are first before we go into Exousia. He said, he is the image, talking about Jesus, of the invincible God. The first verse is him. Any man who comes into Christ, the first thing that happens to him is that he is restored to become a dominion. That's the first level. Because there's no revelation you can have and rebuke a spirit that is higher than you. It's a violation of kingdom protocol. As we are seated here now, you are a citizen of Nigeria. There's no book you will read. There's no revelation you have that you can command the governor. It cannot happen. If you like studying Harvard, the governor might be an illiterate. He may not have certificate, but you cannot use your intelligence to address him. You know why? That one is a place that he has come into is a right that is conferred on him. So in the structure of God, before you exercise authority, they check your class. The reason we can't command God is because he is higher than us. But the reason we can address spirit is because we are dominions. That's the first authority of a believer. Listen, if you don't know that inherently you are a creature of authority, you will never make impact. Why do you think goats are not here? When you designed the flyer, did you say it's for men? You didn't say it's for men. You invited everything that is walking on the street. Why is it that only men came here? Because it is only our class that recognize what is there. And so only our class made it here. No matter how educated the donkey is, he can't have a seat here. You are not seated here because you are wearing a suit. You are seated here because you are a man. And so in this conference, you have legitimacy to participate because of your nature as a man. When we are talking business of authority, you are initiated into it because you are of the royal class. You are created a dominion. 
You lost it in Adam, but in Christ, it was restored to you. And so even before you start having any revelation, you are already a creature of authority. It's the first layer of the believer's authority. Listen, when you walk out of this conference, there are some adjustments that you need to make. Some of us don't know that we are royalty. Revelation 1.6 said he has made you kings and priests. You are a dominion. So all this life of you walk, you can't iron your clothes. You are running everywhere, helter skelter. Stop. The, a consciousness must be born. I am a curiotes. And so when next you go out, you go out like a king. This is not pride. This is not arrogance. This is knowing who you are. This is knowing the class that you belong. Why do you think you pray? You pray because your order permits you to have fellowship with God. Why do you think God commits kingdom to you? It's because your order permits kingdom advancement. Why didn't Jesus give kingdom to donkeys? He rode on donkeys. Donkeys also served him. But when time came for kingdom, it's not a business of donkeys. It's a business of curiosities. We have the power to operate in the realms of spirits because we're created as royals. And in Christ Jesus, the mark of our royalty was placed back on us. Too many Christians don't know that they are royal. And so the first thing that must happen to you if you advance kingdom is to discover that you are royal. In 1 Peter 2, 9, he said you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. God's own special people. God fought to showcase his excellencies. So you were created royal. You were placed in the royal clan. You were designed royal. It's on the basis of that that you can even begin to talk kingdom. You are not a stranger anymore. You have been born into the family of God and now you carry his DNA. So you are in God's class. If this consciousness downs on you, there are certain things that will begin to happen just because you now know that we are the family of God. We are no longer strangers and peasants. We are no longer people looking and hoping that something good will happen to us. We are now joint heirs with Christ. The Bible said in Romans 8, 17, it said you are joint heirs. Why do you think these guys had the audacity to say some things? He said you are a joint heir with Christ. He said he has become first amongst many brethren. You are calling Jesus your brother? Yes, because you are in his class. You have been brought into the royal clan. And so the first definition of authority and the first understanding of authority you must have is that you are now in the God class. John said, as he is, so are we in this world. Every apostle knew this. Paul said, we are joint heirs with Christ. Peter said, we have become his brethren. All of them know this. That the moment you were called a believer, you became part of the family of God. You were restored back into royalty. This is the first realm of the believer's authority. The DNA of God confess royalty on you. Listen, a prince might be a child. He is still a prince. Touch him and see the way the jealousy and the vengeance of the kingdom will come against you. You can look at a prince and say, this is a small boy. Slap him. The bodyguard will come out. The guy doesn't even have intelligence to fight you. If he cries, all he needs to do is to cry. And then the king will say, why is he crying? You know, when you get to Exusia, you start talking revelation. This is not revelation yet. You don't even know you have revelation. You don't know what you have, but you carry DNA. Why do you think you escaped some accident? It's not because you know how to operate by discernment. It's not because you know how to rebuke demons that are on the highway. Accident happened, you just came out. And they ask you, say, I get luck. Who told you you get good luck? There are angels stationed to guard over those who are God's inheritance. There are angels stationed to preserve those who are part of God's, truth, God's company. See, the Bible calls, hear this, the Bible calls Michael the prince of Israel. Why do you think Israel cannot be defeated? Most of them don't even have revelation yet about who they are in Christ. But Michael is their prince because they are God's own people. There is an authority you have because you have God's DNA. But that's not where authority stops. That's the preamble. You now go further. You come into exousia. Exousia is authority based on revelation. It's a positional power. But you grow in it the more you know. 
And so when you come to the level of DNA, it's good. There are certain things you will enjoy, but it's not enough. You need to come to a point where you will accept yourself. Because at the level of, 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 of class, things can happen to you that are good. But when you come to the level of exousia, things don't happen to you. You make things happen. Because now you have the revelation of how things work. And this is the level that a man who will advance kingdom must come into. The Bible said in John chapter 1 from verse 11, it said they came unto his own. His own knew him not. The key is to know. He said, but as many as knew him and received him, he said to them, he gave the exousia to become the sons of God. He gave the authority to become. So there is a level of authority you wield when you start having certain revelations. And so a man who wants to operate exousia must have light of who he is. That means spiritual things he must no longer be ignorant to spiritual things. He must know who he is. He must know what he has. He must know where he's placed. And he must know how to use what he has. So the whole idea behind the teaching of the word of God, as far as authority is concerned, is to remove scales of your eyes so that you will know. Because this type of authority functions to the degree of light that you have. In John chapter 1 verse 1, from verse 1 to 4, he said, in the beginning was the word. He said, the word was with God and the word was God. He said, the same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. He said, in him was life. And he said, the life was the light of men. The moment he became light, something started happening. He said, and that light shines in the darkness. So when you are doing a business of exousia, you must have revelation. If you don't have revelation, you cannot function in exousia. This is why Paul was teaching the church in Ephesus. He said, I pray that God may grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know. Too many Christians don't know. And the way the devil checks is by bringing circumstances. And so the guy is traveling and somebody said something and he starts panicking. What do I do? They say he doesn't know. He dreams and sees somebody pursuing him with a knife. He wakes up and he's panicking. They say he doesn't know. Ah, now we know. So the way the devil checks to see if you know you have exousia is by doing things around you. But when it comes to those who know, I slept, I dreamt, I woke up, somebody was pursuing me with a knife. I said, no way, I'm going back to that dream. We don't run, sir. We are the ones who chase demons. We don't run. No, no, no way. I have the life of God. I have the power of God. I have the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I have the grace of God. I don't run. No, maybe I was exercising. I'm going back to that dream. And I'll say, devil, wherever you are, you must come back here. It is not yet over. It's not running to a pastor or a prophet and say, please anoint me. Oh, I didn't know I had one bad dream yesterday. I don't have bad dreams. Anything that comes, we change it. I'm telling you, anything that wants to happen that is not consistent with our ordination, we stop it. Somebody dreamt and slept and said, hey, I saw you in a coffee and you went on 12 days fasting. No, it's not me you saw, sir. See there, are, see, there are people who can die. I carry too much assignment to die casually. There's too much on my life to die casually. Did you not hear about Simeon? Simeon was in the temple. He wanted to die. He couldn't die. Because he was the one to dedicate Jesus. How can the man who should dedicate Jesus die? So even when death came, death went back until they brought Jesus to the temple. The guy was not even ready. The Bible said Simeon moved by the spirit and he entered and he saw the child and he carried him. He said, now my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. And when he finished prophesying, he said, now I can go in peace. That means the guy wanted to go, but he couldn't go. How can I be praying against that? No, eternal life is on my inside. I carry the life of God. We don't know how to die. Even when our assignment is over, we transit to glory. Did 
to read about the hero, the fathers of faith. The Bible said, when Isaac was old and he knew his assignment was over, he said, go and get me a savory venison that I may eat and my soul will bless you. And when he finished blessing, he said he gathered himself and slept. They finish the assignment, they go. That's people who have understanding. How can you have eternal life and you are afraid of death? Running from one prophet to another and they are blessing oil for you. Blessing all kinds of things for you. Listen, I'm not against the ministry of oil. I'm not against the ministry of covering. But I'm telling you, when you step into the realm of authority, many things will become confirmation. You will not live by the dictates of men. You will know who you are. When Jacob was old, he said, gather around me, you sons of Jacob. I will tell you the things that will befall you. And when he finished speaking to them, the Bible said he gathered himself and slept. When Elijah wanted to go, he told Elijah, today I will be carried. What do you want? That's authority. I'm not afraid of death. I'm not running helter skelter. He has overcome death that I may not die. And when he gave me eternal life, he gave me power over death. Elisha said, give me a double portion of your anointing. He said, you have asked for a hard thing. However, if you see me when I'm taking, oh my God, if you see me when I'm taking, you have it. And when the time came, the guy moved from one city to another city, to another city. He crossed four cities and he went to the Jordan, parted the Jordan and crossed over to the other side. He now turned to him, it's time. What kind of life is that? Is the life of authority. It's not something you do by chance. You know. The guy came to the palace of the king. And said before God whom I stand. There shall be no rain or dew. Except not by the word of God. By my word. Who are you sir? I know the king must think he's a clown. He left the king. Didn't bother. One month later. No rain. Two months later. No rain. Three months later. No rain. Four months later. He called Obadiah. Come. Who did that man say his name was again? That man needs to be known. After eight months, no rain. He sent soldiers. After two years, king himself started looking for him. Wherever he is, please, we want to see him. Please, we want to see him. And the day rain was to come, he said, rush home so that you are not stopped. He knew he could open the heavens. He knew that rain does not fall by chance. There are men with the keys of heaven. And he knew what to do. See, exousia is a function of revelation. There are men who know what to do rain will fall. There are men who know what to do. The dead will come back to life. There are men who know what to do. And your fortune can change. Christianity is not a fluke. It's a deliberate life of understanding. It's divinity expressed through humanity. And every one of us carry it. But the question is, how much light do you have? How much light? This is why light is a priceless commodity in the kingdom. The moment light comes, authority becomes natural. When God appeared to Job, he told him, who is this that darkens counsel by wars without knowledge? He said, declare now if you have understanding. That means in this kingdom, you can't declare until you have understanding. And so any man with understanding is a man of authority. You want to function in a susia, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. But do you know? You must know it by revelation. Ephesians 1.21 says we are seated with Christ. He said Christ is seated in heavenly places. Ephesians 2.6, he said we are seated with him. But the question is, do you know? Do you know you are seated with Christ? Because whether you will wield that power or not, is if you know. And so the reason many believers are not walking in authority is because they don't know. And the devil will do everything to keep us blind. Paul was speaking in 2 Corinthians 4.3. He said, if our gospel be hid... It is he to them that are lost. Whom the God of this world. So the business of the devil is to blind men. He has blinded the eyes of their understanding. From seeing the invincible image of the glorious God. In Ephesians 4.19. He said some of them their understanding is darkened. And said so because of that darkening. He said they cannot walk in the riches. The inheritance. The heritage of the saints. There is something laid aside for us. But it takes light. You want to walk in exousia? You need light. And three ways of walking in light quickly. Number one is by prayer. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, Ask of me, I will answer. But I don't only answer your prayers. Your prayer is too small for where I'm taking you. Your prayer is too simple for the life I give you, I've given you. 
He said, when I answer you, he said, I will now show you great and mighty things that you know not of. So when you start praying, God starts showing. And it's as God starts showing that you start entering authority. Because the moment you see, you become. Second Corinthians 3.18, it says, we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a glass, the image, the glory of the Lord. He said, we are changed. So if you can't see, you can't have. In Genesis chapter 13 verse 14, he had promised Abraham everything, but he needed to see. He said, lift up your eyes. Now begin to look. North, south, east and west is as far as your eyes can see that I've given you. If you want to walk in authority, you need light. You need light. Job said in Job 29 verse 4, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secrets of God was upon my tabernacle, he said, by light, I walk through darkness. See, too many Christians are blinded. They are blinded with immorality. They are blinded with seduction. They are blinded with distraction. They are blinded with the lust of this age. Why do you think the devil is trying to kill everyone with iniquity? Because if you don't flee lust, it will war against your soul. And so the guy fornicates. He comes and says, Lord, I'm sorry. You are forgiving, but you are blinded. It's not about whether God forgives you or not. He will forgive you, but you will be blinded. Because the things of this life will darken your understanding. He said, do not walk like the Gentiles do. In the futility of their mind. Having their understanding darkened. So when we tell people, pray, walk with God. It's because therein is hinged the key to their authority. The moment you see, you are in command. But you see. When you begin to entreat the spirit of God in the altar of prayer. Listen to me brothers and sisters. Anything that kills your prayer altar has destroyed your destiny. I'm a pastor. I can tell you. We can try our best. But as touching your destiny we can do so little. Bulk of the work is tied to your work with God. You must build an altar there. Where God will appear to you. You must build an altar where God will speak to you. You must build an altar where God will reveal himself and the assignment of your destiny to you. Because if you don't see, you cannot be empowered. You know what? One of the things that corrupt the gospel, when men take the place of God and they make others to depend on them like God. That's why Christians have become weak. So people can't see the blueprint of their destiny. I have the audacity to say this because I heard Pastor Larry said that when you are walking in authority, you don't depend on your pastor. I say, oh, they are genuine men indeed. What have you seen since this year began? What have you seen? We can pour oil on your head. We can even empty a drum on you. But if you don't see, you can't wield power. You must see in order to wield power. That is where exousia is hinged. There's a position you have taken with Christ, but you must see it for yourself. I can't see it for you. You must see it for yourself. When I'm teaching you, is to help you see it. Or when you pray, you will see it, but by all means, you must see it. If you don't see it, you cannot become. This is what the apostles live their lives doing. Do you know you have the life of God on your inside? And because you have the life of God, what cannot kill God cannot kill you. Do you know you have the anointing of the Holy Ghost on your life? And because you have that anointing, no devil, no matter what part of hell he comes from, can touch anything about your destiny. Have you become aware? The Bible said in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it now came to us. It said, not many days from now, you too will be anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. So it's the same anointing on Jesus that is on your life. But have you seen it? Have you seen it? The same life of Jesus is what you have now. Have you seen it? Sometimes I read the Bible and I said, ah, Jesus did not even have flu once. And I have the same life he has. What don't I know? He didn't have flu once. What kind of thing is this? And I have his faith. I have his life. I have his anointing. I have his spirit. What is wrong? He said, your understanding is darkened. The more you see, the more power you wield. And so when you go to the place of prayer, you want to see. This is why I tell people, prayer is not gymnastic. Listen, when you pray, don't distract yourself. Oh. 
Because there is something wrong with people who say they are praying now. People are praying, they are carrying chairs, jumping up and down, and they see nothing. You pray for five years, your life is not moving. Don't waste your time. Prayer is a place where we behold. And as we behold, we keep moving. We keep moving. We keep moving. Because the journey is from glory to glory. That's the key to exousia. The second way to access light is to receive the word. I told you already, he said the entrance of thy word. Psalm 119 verse 130. Bring it light. But there are many Christians who don't have a place for the word of God. Check their phone. 90 songs, 88 is secular. They have watched every football match and there's nothing wrong in watching football. But that's all that they keep receiving. They've watched all the football match in the world. They can sit on seasonal movies for three weeks and they finish one, they enter the other. They finish another, they enter. When they finish all of them and there's no one to watch, they are looking for their friends so that they will start gisting all the ones that they have watched. There's no word in their spirit. There's no word. If you need light to walk in authority, you must catch words. If there's one thing that must happen to you in this conference, let your faculty of reception open. Catch words. Catch words. And there's a way to train yourself to catch words. In 1 Timothy 4.13, he said, Until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. He said, give thyself wholly to this thing, verse 15, that your profiting may be made manifest to all. So something is on your life, but you are giving attendance to the wrong thing. In Proverbs 4, verse 20, he said, my son, he said, give attention to my word. Incline thy ears to my saying. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Put them in the midst of thy heart. He said, they are life to them that find them and health to all their flesh. Guard your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. You don't know what you carry. Every time you beg, you break the heart of God. Every time we line up for healing, God weeps. Most of the miracle services we organize, some of them bring heartache to God. These are people that should go into all the worlds and demonstrate my power. They are the ones lining up for healing. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They cast out devils. How come the people who should cast out devils are the ones from whom devils are being cast out? He said they shall lay hands on the sick. The sick shall recover. How come people who should lay hands on the sick are the ones hands are being laid on? He said even if they drink any deadly thing. Jesus himself called it deadly. How can you call something deadly and you say if we drink it, it will not hurt us? Because he knows what he put here. He said you were fearfully and wonderfully made. When God created you, God himself marveled. Which one have I created this time? I thought when I created Gabriel, I finished. I thought when I created Michael, I finished. Which creature is this one? Because this one he created comes to mirror God. He's not just a messenger. He's one that mirrors God. How come the carrier of God has become beggarly and frustrated? Because they know not. Neither will they understand. He said, they walk on in darkness. I have said, ye are gods because you are the children of the Most High. He said, but you will fall like one of the princes. Why? Not because the devil is strong. Because they know not. Listen, your business cannot fail. There is something on your hand. I'm not saying a prophet should come to the shop. I'm telling you, there is something on your hand. There is something that you carry. See, enter into that office. Enter into that business. Lock the door. Makakota, Ragabadagaska, Beregadia, Baratoa. As you pray for a while, heaven will come there. The Holy Ghost lives on your inside. You are God's address. You are God's embassy. You are God's dwelling. How can you carry God into your family and there's attack there? How can you carry God into your business and there's attack there because you are not aware? Listen, I tell myself, when you show up, God shows up. When you speak, God speak. 
when you touch God, touch. Why? Because it dwells on my inside. I'm full of God. He said, this is the mystery of the age. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So God planted himself on your inside so that you can manifest God. But are you aware? The authority of a believer. Jesus gathered 120 men and said, take the whole world. There was no aeroplane. There was no internet. There was no microphone. How do we start? He said, don't worry. Not many days from now, you shall receive something. The Holy Ghost and power is enough. And these guys shut their world down. Shut it down. Peter spoke 3,000 added to the church. Acts 2, 27. He spoke again, Acts 4 verse 4, 5,000 added to the church. What, can, what are you talking? And they kept colonizing until Acts 13, 44. He said, Paul and Barnabas, the whole city came to them. A point came, they started sending ushers, not prophets. Ushers. And Philip went to Samaria. And he preached Christ there. And the whole city, what did they carry? No publicity material. No internet, no vehicle, no car, no money. But they carried something. They carried something from heaven. Listen, publicity is good. But there's something we carry from heaven. There's something on my inside. There's something on my life. I know I carry it. You cannot be normal. You carry too much of God to be normal. You are not a helpless person looking for somebody to help you. You are the answer to your generation. <laughs> You are not a lab rat for demons to test sicknesses on. You are a bomb in Gilead. When you lay your hands, things happen. What we should be doing as believers is to look for creative ways of manifesting God. That's why the Acts of the Apostles is called Acts. They were acting God. A point came, Peter came out of the place of prayer. Acts 5.15, he said, put the sick people, my shadow is enough. Good demon, will I be shouting on every day? And demons were cast out. And Paul had it, really? If that's the case, there's no need to travel around. Take my handkerchief. He pulled his clothes. People are waiting to carry his clothes. So when Paul carries his clothes to the dry cleaner, before they wash it, they take it for a crusade first. Somebody shout! I'm telling you, if you know this, you will go to a dry cleaner and say, wash this suit. He say, ah, it's Martha's gown. No. Give me the gown. Please, beggar, that they will bring it next tomorrow. Let the gown sleep in my house. I'm not talking idolatry. I'm talking you carry something the world know. This is not among Christians. So it's among unbelievers. They know that if your gown enters their family, no demon will remain there. How then can death come to your home? How then can sickness survive in your home? I decree over somebody. Every scale on your eyes goes out now. A generation of men and women that demonstrate God are about to emerge. You didn't hear what the Bible said? He said women brought their dead. These are not prophets. Oh. These are not apostles. Ordinary women who were con you know that word women were not even permitted to be leaders. That's why I call them ordinary. That word but they knew something that when they shall back, the grave will open. Pakakota, the dead rises up and it was normal. So the women ministry is not about dancing and praying for our husbands only. It's a ministry of raising the dead. It's the authority of the believer. Tell yourself, my life is a wonder. Isaiah said, I and the children that the Lord has given to me, we are for size and we are for wonders. I prophesy over someone from this conference, you become a sign and a wonder. The devil is working over time to make you think you are weak. How can you be weak when you have eternal life? The devil is working over time to make you feel that you are vulnerable. How can you be vulnerable when you are anointed? You have too much anointing. The devil is making you feel that your challenge is too big. 
Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can uproot a mountain. And what you have is bigger than the mustard seed. Because he said, he dealt to every one of us the measure of faith. You are not weak. What you need is light. And light is coming to someone now. Light is coming to someone now. That business that failed, you will go back and prophesy it to come back to life. Listen, it's not only dead men that come back to life. Even dead businesses come back to life. Even dead ministries come back to life. Go and read about Amy Semper McFarsing. She had two marital challenges on two occasions that should have wrecked the ministry. But what she carried was too strong for the ministry to die. She resurrected it back. Another marriage crisis happened. Ministry is supposed to die. She resurrected it back. Ministries come back to life. Businesses come back to life. Men come back to life. And I decree over you, everything dead in your life resurrects now. That's why God fortified you. You are not a non-entity. You are not a charlatan. Listen, the platform you need is not this one. Every challenge of your life is a platform. Go back and begin to manifest. I'm telling you, do it. You will be shocked what God will do. It will humble you and you will start crying. Did I carry all of this, all this? Why? The devil, your time is over here. And he will know he will never come again. Lift your hands toward heaven. We are out of time. I would have told you about the third dimension of authority, which is a function of alignment. That's where Iskos comes in. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 5, he said, concerning our battles and our warfares, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to verse 5, project it for me quickly, let them see it. He said, for though we walk in the flesh, he said, we do not war after the flesh. He said, the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. You know what those weapons are? They are the anointings on your life. They are the graces on your life. They are the eternal lives, the dimensions of eternal life that you carry. You carry weapons. They are the words that you have caught. He said they are not carnal. He said they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He now said casting down imaginations. Every high standing thing that opposes itself above the knowledge of God. That's where light comes. So they told you before, the village where you come from, nobody prospers. You say, not me. Although I was born in that village, but my life begins on the cross. And my life started from the resurrection. So I don't know what you are talking about. I connect. See, when I started preaching, they told me, unless you are a fifth generation preacher, you can't make impact. They said the first three generations will be fighting battles to prepare the way. I said, why did God say, I didn't come here to fight battles. I came here to manifest light to my generation. When I read my Bible, it said, though you were a desolate land, no man went through you. He said, but I have made you. He didn't say, I will make you. He said, I have made you an eternal excellency. The joy of many generations. I will manifest in my life. What do you mean by that? Meanwhile, I'm the first person who spoke in tongues in my family. So I'll be fighting, hand over warfare to my son. My son will hand over to the next one. Before the fourth generation, will the world not end that time? No way. He said, arise, shine. Your light is come. That's what is cast imaginations down. Some of the dogmas, some of the tales, some of the adage you walk with, they have limited you. Carry the word, run with it. That's why I thank God for churches like this that are not just excellent, but they are decked with revelation. They tell you, if you're an African, forget it. There's no, you can't go too far. What do you mean? Africa we lead the world in the last dispensation. I'm not trying to run to America. If God sends you there, go. But we'll be here and give direction to many Americans. You want to make somebody, and then some white guys come with a egocentric complex and racism. They look at you, they want to feel, what do you mean? Are you okay? I carry the life of God, sir. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I'm the son of the king. I reign in life. What do you mean? It's not color that determines dominion. It's DNA. I carry the DNA of God. Don't let anybody look down on you. He said, cast it down imaginations. They tell you, they are, they are just a woman. What do you mean by that? Who is a woman? Both woman and man is one species. 
He said, in the beginning, God said, let us make man in our own image. And he said, in his image, he made them male and female. Both of us are the image of God. What do you mean by you are just a woman? I will be a woman, but I will make impact in my generation. Casting down imagination. And he said, when you have done that, there is one more thing. He said, when your obedience is complete, he said, then you will avenge all disobedience. This is why you cannot afford to be a fornicator. You cannot afford to be a liar. You cannot afford to be rude. You cannot afford to live in iniquity. Because after revelation comes alignment. After revelation comes obedience. After revelation comes consecration. Don't only talk Bible, live Bible. They say in a great house, there are many vessels. He says some is unto honor, some is unto dishonor. He said if a man purges himself, there is a cleansing requirement. There's an obedience requirement. And this is where many of us err. And so the devil may know you know all the scriptures that defines your authority. But he will come and punctuate you with iniquity. And then you do that thing behind closed door. You're off the light. It's men that may not see you. But in the spirit, you are naked. There are too many cloud of witnesses watching every of your action. And so if you know that, anytime the devil comes, you tell him, this body belongs to God. There is only one operating system here. It's the Holy Spirit. I will not allow anger. I will not allow malice. I will not allow lying. See, the devil is smart. Don't make any mistakes about it. You are going somewhere to fulfill destiny. They bring somebody's case and you join them and gossip. Don't do that. It's murder. When they are talking about somebody, my only responsibility is to love and pray for them. I will not be part of that discussion. You lie, they lie against somebody. They draw you into the conspiracy. I'm not part of it. I will never be found in a place where men are put down. My errand is to lift men up. I'm a man of authority. You will never allow it. They tell you, oh, people are smoking. They are catching fun here. Not me. We are ruled by the Holy Spirit because we are creatures of authority. If your revelation is not backed up with consecration, there will be no power. A believer is fortified with too much authority. But it takes a knowing of your DNA. It takes revelation of who you are and what you have in God. And it takes obedience to the Holy Spirit to walk in the believer's authority. And when you enter the believer's authority, you rule over spirits. You rule over circumstances. You rule over systems and territories. And you rule in the affairs of men. These are the four scope of the believer's authority. But I don't have time to get into it. Can I pray for someone tonight? Welcome to Nakazu Watch TV. On Nakazu Watch TV, we are a great team and work on life transforming messages that will bring you into realms of divine encounter with the world of truth. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share our videos. God bless you.